Well, this morning we begin our series entitled, This Must Be Stronger Than That. And it really comes out of the story and the life of a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a German pastor and a theologian who was ultimately martyred for his faith. But during World War II, Bonhoeffer became really disillusioned, really frustrated with the condition and the state of the church at large in Germany and how they were allowing Hitler and the culture of the Nazi regime to shape and mold and transform the church. And so he started a resistance movement called the Confessing Church. Now, it didn't take long for the confessing church to come under fire, under attack. And eventually, um, it became illegal to give to this church. It became illegal to attend this church. And eventually, its meetings were forcibly shut. Well, not to be deterred in the fact that Bonhoeffer believed that Jesus was the head of the church and not Hitler that the gospel and the church should shape and transform the surrounding culture rather than the culture shape the church, he began an underground seminary, an underground Bible college. Well, it had been going for a while, and one of his friends decided that he needed to pay Bonhoeffer a visit. He needed to come to Germany to visit Bonhoeffer. Because he'd heard the reports of this underground Bible college, that it was a bit extreme. He'd read one of Bonhoeffer's books that came out while he was leading this seminary, and he thought it was really just a bit hardcore. And so he thought, I better come to Germany and visit Bonhoeffer, more or less to tell him he should just chill out a little bit with his faith. Well, he obviously didn't know Bonhoeffer very well, because when he got there, Bonhoeffer wouldn't have a bar of what he had to say. In fact, he got him in a little rowboat and he rowed his friend across to the other side of the river. And when they got there, they climbed a hill to a vantage point where they could see this little ragtag seminary on the bank of this river. And in the other direction, they could see this critical landmark. And they could see Nazi planes landing and taking off. They could see battalion after battalion of Nazi soldiers marching. And he looked at his friend in the rowboat and he said, This must be stronger than that. This, the expression of the gospel, the reconciliating power of the gospel, must be stronger than this army that's being forged on oppression and violence. This must be stronger than that. In the next four weeks, as we begin 2020, we're going to look at four disciplines that need to be stronger than their counterparts if we, like Bonhoeffer, are going to take the gospel seriously and see it transform our lives and the culture around us. And so this morning, the first one that we're going to look is that hunger must be stronger than apathy. Now, if you've been around the Christian faith for a while, it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that pretty much at the top of the list, in terms of things that we should do as Christian, is is our desire and our hunger for God, right? Jesus himself says that this is the most central discipline in the Christian outworking of their faith. Matthew 22 says this, but when the Pharisees heard that he had been silent, that he had silenced the Sadducees with his remarks, this is Jesus they're talking about, they met together to question him again. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your mind, and all your soul. Maybe I got it around the wrong way. Some translations say, with all your passion, with all your desire, with all your hunger. And just in case we're not sure how serious Jesus is, in the book of Revelation, at the end of the Bible, Jesus is critiquing seven churches and the way that they've lived and outworked their faith. 
And one of the harshest criticisms to any of the churches he critiques comes to a church called Laodicea for this exact reason that their hunger had been lost in a sea of apathy. That they'd been chasing the desires of the culture, the desires of the day, instead of Jesus himself. And Jesus says this to that church, I know you inside and out and find little to my liking. You're not cold, you're not hot. Far better to be either cold or hot. You're stale, you're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. They're harsh words. You brag, I'm rich, I've got it made. I need nothing from anyone. Oblivious that in fact you're a pitiful, blind beggar, threadbare and homeless. He continues, the people I love, I call to account, prod and correct and guide so that they'll live at their best. Up on your feet then, about face, Run after God. Hunger God. Desire God. Don't be stagnant. Don't be stale. This was the message Jesus had for the church at Laodicea, and it's the message that he has for us this morning. Hunger must be stronger than apathy. Amen? And so this morning I want to look at three attributes of hungry people. That as we start 2020 we can begin to appropriate them in our lives and in our pursuit of Jesus. The first habit of the hungry is this. Hungry people aren't picky. I don't know if this has ever happened to anyone else, but this happens to me, right? Sometimes when I'm starving and I come home late or I've been working away at something for ages and I lose track of time, and I realize, oh, I'm starving. I go to the fridge or I go to the pantry and I open it. And invariably, the first things that I see staring back at me are the things I hate. <laughs> the things that we have lots of that are always on tap. Boring essentials like wheat bix or plain porridge or plain rice. And I have this little narrative in my brain. I look back at this food with great scorn, like, who are you? This is not the depression. I work full time. I want something delicious. And so as I'm surveying the fridge, for, for me, it's like avocado or cheese, maybe a bit of salami on some fresh bread. But invariably, if I realize that there's nothing in the fridge that I think is delicious, guess what happens? I don't throw my arms up in there and go, ha, no cheese and caviar, I'm not eating today. <laughs> no, I'm hungry. So I begrudgingly get the box of wheat bix out, drown it in a kilo of honey just to make it a bit better, and I eat it because hungry people aren't picky. Hungry people don't walk into church complaining that they have to worship God to music they don't like. Hungry people... Don't see it as a hassle to serve their neighbor. Hungry people don't have to be asked to use their gifts and talents. They're hungry, and so they'll worship God wherever, whenever, with whoever. They're hungry, so they'll invite anyone into their life group or home, regardless of their social status, regardless of the person's personal hygiene, regardless of all sorts of things. They're always on edge, ready to experience and participate in the kingdom life that God called them to, full stop. Because hungry people aren't picky. The second attribute of hungry people is this. Hungry people are single-minded. A number of years ago when I was living in Melbourne... One weekend, I went down to the coast, a place called Lawn, with a friend of mine. And we stayed there for the weekend. And one morning after breakfast, we decided to go for a hike. And after we'd been hiking for a few hours, the hiking path began to kind of wiggle and wind down into a valley. And in this valley was this seemingly abandoned apple orchard. It was like 30 rows of apples this way and 30 rows this way. It was like a perfect square. 
And as we came and sat down under the shade and surprisingly ate an apple, I said to my buddy, I was like, dude, why don't we play Bang Bang, but use the apples? Now, to catch you up, Bang Bang was a game that we designed and played in high school. And it was really quite simple. It was like a real version of Call of Duty, where you would run around with your selected library book, pretending that you were an army soldier shooting all your buddies. You would slide books around like they were grenades, and it was amazing fun. There were lots of rules to the game, but the most important one was obviously, don't get caught by the librarian, because if you did, you were banned for quite some time. Now, I'll admit, and those of you who know me, I don't have very good eyesight, right? And so one day, I thought my buddy was crouching behind the non-fiction section. And so I jumped around the aisle with my, I don't know why, but I always went with Bryce Courtney's book, Jessica. Just nice feel, good size to it. And I jumped around the corner. I was like, you're dead! And the 70-year-old library uh, librarian looked up at me and was like, no, young fella, you're dead. Straight to the headmaster's office. But it was great fun. And so this day when we're hiking, we're playing this game of bang bang with apples and we're throwing them at each other and we're hiding and we're ducking and we're weaving. We've got lob attacks, surprise attacks. It was great. And I'd managed to work my way out to the perimeter of this apple orchard. And I'm crouching down trying to ascertain where my buddy is. And all of a sudden I see him out of the corner of my eye diagonally to, the, to my left. And as I begin looking for some rotten, juicy apples that I can, like, surprise attack and peg him with, out of the corner of my right eye, diagonally to my right, I see a man beginning to walk down the hiking path and approach the apple orchard. I thought, hmm, this could be interesting. Well, as he's making a little bit of noise as he approaches the apple orchard, I watch my friend and instantly he swivels in the direction of this guy. He puts his head under the trees and I can see a bit of a smile on his face and he's gathering apples and all of a sudden he throws one. Not in my direction. In the direction of this bloke. Well, it wasn't a great shot and it went spam close enough that the guy was kind of like, Stop, like, what was that? Well, I could see my friend kind of chuckling, like, I know where Hornby is. And so he launches another. This one was a pretty good shot. Bam, right at the guy's feet. And at this, the guy was like, hey. Well, the best part is, my buddy still didn't believe it wasn't me. <laughs> he thought I was putting on a voice to try and trick him. And so he yells out, yeah, good one, Hornby, and chucks another. Now, at this, I was like, this is not ending well. So as that apple is coming out of his fingertips, I start legging it for the hiking path. And as he releases that apple and sees me come out of the bush from a totally different point than where he's throwing apples, he turns around and starts running for the bush too. The apple lands, bang, we, I don't know if it hit him or not, but all we hear is, a, that does it. We run and we hide under the cover of the hiking trail until you know, the scene is settled down. You see, but my buddy was so focused, was so single-minded on trying to win this game, trying to scone me with a good, rotten, juicy apple, that he failed to realize that when he put his head under to see the shins of the man on the opposite side of this apple orchard, that he was wearing blue jeans and I was wearing shorts. You see, hungry people know what it means to be single-minded, to be focused on what actually matters with their time and their money and their talents. Hungry people understand the importance of being single-minded in an effort to give themselves every opportunity at experiencing whatever the object of their hunger is. You know, I always say, the only reason Roger Federer became Roger Federer was because in year 10, he said no to learning the guitar, was because he said no to learning Spanish lessons, was because he said no to trying to keep up to date with watching the latest series on Netflix. 
And the Apostle Paul understood what it meant to be single-minded and focused as well. He says in Philippians 3, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. And in 2020, if we're, going to love the, if we're going to learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul, all our passion, if we're going to learn what it means to be hungry for the kingdom and see His kingdom expressed and released here on earth, then like Paul, we need to learn to be single-minded. And it's not that we can't have hobbies. It's not that we can't enjoy ourselves or have downtime. It's just that these hobbies or this downtime, we learn to fit in and around or filter through our primary pursuit, which is intimacy with Christ. Hungry people are single-minded. The last attribute, we're a little bit quiet. Are we all right? I haven't said anything heretical yet. Adam won't get back and fire me. The last attribute, I'm kind of joking, but not. Uh, the last attribute of hungry people is this. Hungry people persevere. You know, other than the fact that all three of these individuals were incredibly successful in their respective fields, the thing that Bill Gates, Walt Disney, and Michael Jordan all have in common is that they only experienced the level of greatness that they did because they persevered. In fact, if you talk to anyone anywhere who's ever done anything even slightly remarkable, they will tell you the same story. You see, Walt Disney was fired from a local newspaper for lacking creativity. Wow. Bill Gates, his first company wasn't Microsoft. His first company was a company called Trafodata. And it was this software thing that was meant to like analyze traffic videos. It was terrible. It didn't even work and totally sent him bankrupt. Michael Jordan, who's arguably the greatest basketball player ever to have walked the earth, obviously behind Matt Grimmett and Adam Lowe, <laughs> was actually cut from his high school basketball team. I don't mean like domestic or rep. I don't mean college or university. His high school basketball team. In fact, Jordan says this. It was embarrassing not making the team. I went home, locked myself in my room and cried. Then I picked myself up and turned that cut into motivation. Whenever I was working out and got tired, and I figured I ought to stop, I'd close my eyes, and I'd see the list in that locker room without my name on it. That was usually enough to get me going again. You see, hungry people know what it means to persevere. And I've got to be honest with you this morning, I think sometimes... I'm not very good at this. In fact, I think Christians in general aren't necessarily very good at this. As soon as our child gets sick or we lose a job or we don't get the outcome that we were praying for, suddenly we start questioning, God, are you even loving? Are you even out there? Yet hungry people know how to persevere. I believe this. I believe that when we're hungry for God, no manner of skewed or devastating circumstances can withstand the perseverance of someone who's hungry, someone who's passionately seeking and craving intimacy with Jesus. Look at Job. Job chapter 1 says this, one day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them when the Sabaeans raided us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another person came. And they said this, 
The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, gets worse, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Now, let me paraphrase this in the 21st century. Basically, what happened is Job got a text message or an email to say, guess what? That superannuation that you had for 40 years that was going to pay your retirement, gone. Those Commonwealth Bank shares that you put all your money into and invested in, it crashed and they're worth nothing. That property that you bought or you tried to develop, hmm, turns out it wasn't actually yours to buy and you no longer own it. In a moment, all of Job's resources, all of Job's ability to earn was gone out the window. And I don't know about you, but if that were me, God would probably hear some colorful language. But let's imagine for a second that he didn't, right? And I was amazing and I took it in my stride. The next part would absolutely get me. Because after these three people have just communicated this to Job, this is what happens. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters, all of your children, were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Man, if that were me, that would knock me over the edge, I reckon. And yet, listen to what Job says and does. Job stood up, tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head, fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb, and I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. That sends shivers down my spine. Here was a situation, if I've ever heard of one, that you'd be forgiven to feel justified in being bitter and angry toward God and the world, that you'd be ready to throw in the towel, yeah? And yet, what does Job do? He doesn't. Because he's a man that perseveres. He's a man that was confident that while he couldn't explain or rationalize what on earth was going on, that God, who is the object of his hunger, his love, and his desire, was somehow, some way, still at work. You know what? And ultimately, Job was right. You see, hungry people persevere. You see, hunger and desire is a powerful force. And ultimately, our deepest hungers and our deepest desires will will be responsible for quite literally shaping the course of our life. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 6, For where your treasure is, there your heart, your wishes, your desires, that on which you center your life, There your heart is also. You know, and learning to be less picky, learning to be single-minded, and learning to persevere in our pursuit and our desire for God is absolutely half of the equation. Because the other half is this. When you think about the mechanism of hunger, why do people get hungry? Now, I'm not talking about mental health issues or eating disorders. I'm not talking about what they call hedonic hunger when you eat for pleasure or to pacify emotions. But in general, why do people get hungry? Lots of participation this morning. (laughs) I'll tell you why they get hungry. The brain sends a signal to the body that says, I need fuel. Why? Someone said that? Come on! It was almost right. Why does the the body need fuel? Because it's expending energy. And why is the body expending energy? 
because it's active, because a person's taking action. You see, hunger is the byproduct of action. You see, hunger is not caught, it's cultivated. Say that again. Hunger is not caught, it's cultivated. This is important because you are never going to wake up one morning going, oh, I just love Jesus. It's not going to happen. You have to cultivate it. You know, I think the greatest lie of our generation is this, that feelings are the barometer of truth. If it feels right, do it. If you feel like you want to identify as whoever or whatever you want, then do it. But you know what? Feelings aren't the barometer of truth. They're not the originator of truth. Listen to this. They are the byproduct of action. They're not the cause. They're the effect. And if we're going to learn to hunger God, we've got to learn that we don't catch it, we cultivate it. See, if you want to be and feel hungry for God this morning, then you have to make choices. You have to take actions that put yourselves in positions to cultivate this. Things like attending regular worship gatherings, even when you can't be bothered. Things like praying regularly and fervently and expectantly, even when it seems unlikely that God might move. Things like giving audaciously, even if you feel like you don't have much to give. See, hunger is cultivated, it's not caught. And I really believe this morning that God is calling the church to be stronger than the culture of our day. That Christians, as Christians, our hunger should be stronger than our apathy. And here's why. Because when that happens, the broken are healed. The blind see. The captive are set free. When that happens, our life is actually transformed by our relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray in the midst of a culture and a time that would thrust upon us option after option after option to draw our attention, to draw our hunger away from you. We pray that you would draw near to us. We pray that you'd help us hunger and thirst after you. Because God, you're the only one that can sustain. God, I ask this morning for me and for your church that you would help us learn to be less picky. You would help us learn to be single-minded and you would help us learn to persevere. But ultimately, God, that you would help us learn to cultivate hunger for you. That we would be people who make choices and take actions irrespective of how we feel. Holy Spirit, I pray and ask, would you touch your people? Would you draw us into a life-transforming relationship? comes as a result of our deep and earnest hunger to know you and be intimate with you. Father God, would you bless your people in your son's precious name we pray. Amen.